Now, most companies would be delighted right there, but we went further. Network deployments are faster than ever. And where their old network generated problem tickets faster than anyone could count, the number of WAN-related tickets has decreased 70% in the past year. All of this to prove that between those frozen processes of yours and free-flowing productivity, there's a bridge. Tell us what you're imagining, and we will build the bridge to get you there. The Port of Shanghai is the largest seaport in the world. It's also the busiest, handling over 40 million containers in 2017, setting a new world record. But what happens when the world's busiest port needs to get even busier? As China's economy continues to grow, we need to be able to handle even more container volume. Adding more people and equipment doesn't help. You end up with increased traffic, which actually lowers efficiency. The solution was intelligence. In 2017, the Port of Shanghai began a digital transformation plan that would revolutionize the entire shipping business. Imagine a port, fully automated and fully intelligent. Our approach to increase volume was to use an intelligent port automation system that increases the efficiency of all port resources. Port of Shanghai's Yangsheng automated system was fully designed and developed by our group's Shanghai Harbor eLogistics software company. A system this important demands a high-performance infrastructure with unmatched reliability. We chose Cisco Hyperflex because of its ease of deployment and management capabilities. In addition, we were concerned about the continuous growth of the port and the ever-increasing volume and needed a data center infrastructure with rapid scalability and superb performance. Today, the Port of Shanghai is not only the world's busiest port, it's also considered the most advanced automated container port in the world. If we can help the world's busiest port get even busier, where can Cisco take your business? Between growing fast and growing smart, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Between what is hoped for and what can be, there's a bridge. Between the aspirations of a ball club and the greatest sports venue in America, there's a bridge. Between chaos and wonder, endangered and protected, there's a bridge. Built on technology that can solve, create, heal, inspire and secure a bridge there from the beginning to where we stand today and where we will go from here one company one promise if you can imagine it we will build the bridge to get you there cisco the bridge to possible the town I grew up in hasn't changed much since I was young. There just aren't many opportunities there. Higher education was out of reach, so kids didn't dream of getting a decent job. But my family always strived to provide a better life for me than they had for themselves. When I decided to take classes at the Cisco Networking Academy, my father worked extra jobs and even sold his van so I could afford living in the city. I graduated in 2007 and have been working in Zhengzhou ever since. On my day off, I travel back home to see my family. The look on their faces when I walk out the door makes being away all week worth it. I have a wonderful opportunity to provide a better life for my wife and our children. And an even greater opportunity to take care of my mother and father, to repay them for all the sacrifices they made. I've been able to buy them a car and a house, and that has made them so proud, especially my mother. And that means the world to me.
never imagined I would be where I am today. Between a better job and a better life, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. This business started 53 years ago as a hobby, and it still is a hobby to everyone that works here. It started with audio, they added lights, and it was sound and lights for quite a while. They added video, lasers, pyrotechnica, they added automation. Currently, right now, as we roll into the summer, we have about 350 tours happening. We support around 1,000 artists in a given year. We're seeing interesting trends in the live event industry. Everybody is pushing to be bigger. They want to do something more spectacular this year than they did last year. And so because it is an art form, there's a tremendous amount of unknown. Our artists, they push us. And so when they push, we need to have a team that can deliver globally. We've always used Cisco switching WebEx and phones internally. Cisco moving into more of the cloud and collaboration really tied all of those pieces together for us. In our line of business, we always need to get it right the first time, every time. As soon as the gear rolls off the truck in the morning, it needs to roll into place, be plugged in, and everything needs to come up and be working the exact same way that it was the night before, you know, in a city that could be, you know, thousands of miles away. At Claire, it's important that we boldly advance the live entertainment industry. It has to be lighter, it has to be smaller, it has to be more reliable. Cisco understands that. They're everywhere, we're everywhere, so the partnership just makes sense. And so together, we're able to be flexible, but we're also able to think big. Like I said, it started as a hobby. To us, it's still a hobby. So if you provide the best technology for people who love what they do every day, they're going to succeed, because every day is a good day. Between setting the stage and owning it, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Ever since she was a little girl, Eva has always wanted to help people. So when she started working with Living Goods, she knew she had found more than just a job. Eva travels to some of the most remote villages you can imagine, delivering medicine, giving health advice, and just listening to her patients. Thanks to an app created by Living Goods and its partners, Cisco and Medic Mobile, she has the latest health information at her fingertips and can keep track of every delivery and every person she meets. It gives her time to focus on what she does best, taking care of people. Between making a living and making a difference, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Domino's customers have one thing in common when placing an order. They're hungry. They want their pizza, and they want it ASAP, if not sooner. So Domino's began looking for ways to simplify the ordering process. That's when they called Cisco. From the data center to the store, Cisco built a secure, scalable infrastructure that helped streamline ordering. In other words, it got hot food to hungry customers faster, no matter what platform they ordered from while giving Domino's an edge over their competitors. Delicious. Between craving a better experience and delivering it, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. There is something unique about our baby's cry. Like no other sound, it stirs our instinct to nurture and protect. Unfortunately, those cries sometimes go unheard. Because in some neonatal wards in Uganda, there isn't enough equipment or staff. Now those cries can be heard with the help of a wearable monitor that displays critical information for each baby, enabling nurses to immediately respond with the proper care. This life-saving technology was developed by Neopenda, a medical device company serving emerging markets and underserved people. Cisco's support helped Neopenda further develop the technology that connects its devices. This is one more example of how Cisco empowers social entrepreneurs to use innovative technology to make the world better. Between a baby's cry 
and a nurse's care. There's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Wake up in one city, go to sleep in another. Life on the road is relentless. I've been in the music industry for about 15 years now. I've got about 20 tours under my belt. Those tours have taken me all over the world. Tours today rely on tech. This tour relies on Cisco. No matter where we are in the world, when we arrive at the venue, the first question everybody asks is, what's the Wi-Fi password? That's the most crucial piece for setting up our production office and getting to work. We've got over 100 full-time touring staff. Every single one of us uses our phone to communicate with one another. The producers, the dancers, the band, even the lighting trusses communicate with Justin's in-ears over the Cisco Meraki system. So when Justin navigates the stage, they can all move as a unit. There's really no room for error. It needs to work every single time. Cisco gives us the reliable connectivity we need to deliver the best experience possible for Justin's fans. When anybody has a moment to catch a break on tour, the first thing we do is connect with our loved ones. Hi, honey. Anything we can do to feel like we're home. When we are working on the world's best tours, we want the world's best partners, and we're lucky to have Cisco as a partner. It makes our lives so much easier. Between the show and the business, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. I was really good in math and physics. So that was my favorite subject since high school. That's actually how I ended up in engineering. My name is Alfonsine Imaneraguha. I am a consulting engineer at Cisco in the US. But I was born in Rwanda. It was April 6th, 1994. That night, we heard like a loud explosion in the sky. We rushed to listen to our radio and we learned that president of Rwanda, that his plane was shut down. That was the beginning of the genocide. I was 13 years old. I remember just hiding in, in the bushes, not sleeping at home at night. My dad was like, hide here, I'm going to find another place where we can safely all hide. As soon as my dad left, we immediately overheard the group of militia men say that they just killed him. I didn't feel the ground. I didn't feel the air around me. There was no wind. There was no sun. I was already dead. Eventually, I found my three younger siblings. They were in the orphanage. At that point, I was like, I don't know what's gonna happen, but my life has a meaning. Just watching how one person could make a big difference, I started my nonprofit, Rising Above the Storms. We work with the homeless kids. We help them go back to school. I could have ended on the street. I could have been one of them and just Seeing them actually dreaming, it gives me hope. Doesn't matter how you do it, make a goal to change one life. Seeing how Cisco has enabled me to do something I love so much, it's, I can't imagine a better feeling in this life. Between survival and inspiration, there's Alphonsine Imanaraguha. company on the planet is looking at a new reality. When it says that you're no longer tapping into a cloud, you're unleashing its full potential. Adapt to change faster. Connect anyone to anything anywhere faster. You want to grow your business? Boom. But here's the thing. This new reality comes with realities of its own. Applications are harder to control, harder to secure. Costs escalate. An ever-increasing complexity suddenly 
You're running out of resources, man. But guess what? Between all the promises and making it happen, there's a bridge. One built on security that isn't an afterthought, but the main thought. Intentional from the start, in the right place, at the right time, between all your connections. One that lets you deliver applications on time, on any platform, for a better experience every time. And one that lets you manage an entire network simply at scale. This is the new reality made real. And the company that invented the network in the first place is now ready to take you to this new place where the power of the network moves at the speed of the cloud. Wherever you are, wherever you need to go, happens like that. Smarter, deeper, and more flexible than ever. This is SD1. And this, this is the bridge to get you there. Cisco, the bridge to possible. The power is here, and here, but also here and definitely here. Anywhere you need the full force and power of your infrastructure, hyper-converged. It's like having thousands of data centers, wherever you need them, powering applications anywhere they live, but managed from the cloud. So you can automate everything from here. Cisco HyperFlex goes anywhere. Cisco, the bridge to possible. The town I grew up in hasn't changed much since I was young. There just aren't many opportunities there. Higher education was out of reach, so kids didn't dream of getting a decent job. But my family always strived to provide a better life for me than they had for themselves. When I decided to take classes at the Cisco Networking Academy, my father worked extra jobs and even sold his van so I could afford living in the city. I graduated in 2007 and have been working in Zhengzhou ever since. On my day off, I travel back home to see my family. The look on their faces when I walk out the door makes being away all week worth it. I have a wonderful opportunity to provide a better life for my wife and our children and an even greater opportunity to take care of my mother and father, to repay them for all the sacrifices they made. I've been able to buy them a car and a house, and that has made them so proud, especially my mother. And that means the world to me. I never imagined I would be where I am today. Between a better job and a better life, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Action. Camera one, zoom out. Ready camera two, take two. Hi, and welcome to this episode of Cisco Chat Live. I'm Stephanie Chan, guest moderator for this week's chat on making an impact on homelessness. Before we get started, a reminder that we'll be taking your questions live at the end of the show. Use the Cisco Chat hashtag on Twitter or post your question in the comments if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. So joining us today, we have Erin Connor. She's the portfolio manager for Cisco Corporate Affairs. Thank you for joining us, Erin. Thank you for having me. And we're also joined by Chad Bajorquez, Senior Director of Destination Home. Thank you for joining us, Chad. Thank you. It's great to be here. Finally, we're joined on TP by Joel Roberts, CEO of PATH. Thank you for joining us, Joel. Hi. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Now that everyone here has been introduced, let's get started with the first question. And this one is for Aaron. Can you tell us what the homelessness challenge is in the United States and the Bay Area broadly? Sure. Um, I think in the last homeless census count, which they do every other year, found that uh, on any given night there were over 550,000 people that were living without a home in the United States. We've seen homelessness levels really kind of balloon in the 70s and 80s, largely after the Vietnam War and the deinstitutionalization of mental hospitals. Um, and continue to increase. It's kind of plateaued over the last six years, but what we've seen is 
skyrocketing levels of homelessness in the cities that are the richest and the fastest growing. So that's certainly the case in the Bay Area where there's a thriving economy. Uh, also the case in San Diego and LA, uh, Seattle. Uh, New York, and so we are, we're seeing it's a little bit different. There was a Huffington Post article last week that talked about how homelessness is no longer a sign of decline, but a product of prosperity. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're seeing that here, where it's, um, you know, there's, there's a portion of the homeless population that are chronic, but there's an increasingly, um, an increasing percentage of people that are experiencing it as a single episode, and largely because rents are increasing and there's not enough uh, livable wage jobs. Yep. Can I, so, can I add to that? Yeah, for sure. Um, when PATH started, PATH started in Los Angeles, but we're statewide and we started 35 years ago. And when the founders actually started the organization to help people who are homeless, they literally thought 35 years ago that, that they would be done in about five years, that it was just a temporary problem you help, you know, give them, give a person a shelter, help them find a job, and they'll they'll move on. And you know, 35 years later, it's just become the worst social problem in America today. So, Joel, this question is for you as well. Can you expand on what homelessness looks like in America? You know. We think of the stereotype of a person who's homeless as the inebriated man in Skid Row. And that was 20, 30 years ago, even 40 years ago. Um, then all of a sudden it became people struggling with mental health issues and, and uh, substance abuse addiction. And what's happening today is it, it's different now. It's, those stereotypes are gone. What we're seeing all over the state of California are people like you and me and our relatives and our friends who are ending up on the streets. I mean, we see uh, the girl who, who's, who just came out of the foster care system in San Diego became, becoming homeless. The senior in San Jose who gets evicted from her apartment she, because she can't pay the rents anymore. The woman in Santa Barbara who, who's, who's uh, discharged from the hospital and has nowhere to go. It, we're just seeing it uh, different kind of people now who are ending up on the streets. Yeah, Joel, uh, just to talk a little bit more about it from a statistical standpoint, um, for example, a most recent count in Santa Clara County, over 41% of those surveyed of the homeless population uh, were homeless for the very first time. So it's not folks who have been homeless for long periods of time, chronically homeless. 15% um, families. 83% um, of the folks were had local roots, were from Santa Clara County. Um, so it's really not the kind of transient, uh, chronic homeless nature, uh, nature that yeah. you talked about. Um, and then something else that we're really digging into is around racial equity. Um, and what we found so far looking at very recent data in our homeless system of care is that, for example, black and African-American folks are eight times more likely to be homeless than the general population in Santa Clara County. So we definitely have uh, some inequities when it comes to race. Yeah. And also, I mean, there was a recent study that found that 40% of Americans could not absorb a $400 emergency expense. Mm -hmm. And so all it, all it takes for some people is a car breaking down uh, or some sort of health emergency and a bill that they can't make uh, or an increase in rent. There was a recent study that found a $100 increase in rent corresponded to a 15% increase in homelessness. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times the difference between people that have a roof over their heads and people that end up on the streets are safety nets uh, or family community that they can rely on um, in a pinch because it's you know it could happen to anybody absolutely it, it, it's just it's it's just amazing because I, I get phone calls from people that I haven't seen for 10 or 15 20 years maybe in high school or college or as a young adult and People are telling me, you know, my brother's on the street, can you help them? And it's just, you know, these are middle class, upper middle class families. It's, it's not just this, uh, you know, inebriated man on Skid Row anymore. It's just happening throughout our whole society. Chad, it, would you say that homelessness is solvable? Oh, most definitely. <laughs> can, uh, you, can you talk about maybe some of your solutions? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we absolutely feel that homelessness is solvable. That's what excites me about this work. Um, the bottom line is that housing is the solution to homelessness. Um, and our overall philosophy um, in this community and really in the country as a whole, it's really turned the tide about how we intervene with homelessness and how we address homelessness is something called housing first, which literally means you, know, you take the individual, no matter where they're at, put them in housing, the community benefits, the individual benefits immediately, and then you start addressing whatever the root causes are and whatever's going on in that person's life. Um, within that, we have kind of three core interventions that really work because not everybody's homeless uh, experience is the same. So you have your kind of long-term, chronically ill, um, older, disabled folks. Uh, for them, we provide permanent support, uh, rental subsidy, but also the support needed as life you know, still happens, right, once you get housed. Then we have a large portion of our uh, population here locally and across the country that we consider transitionally homeless. And if they get the right kind of support, case management, uh, housing with some uh, rental subsidy, and access to employment, access to benefits, um, that they can be on the path to self-sufficiency and eventually be independent and stably housed. And then uh, something that we're getting into in partnership uh, with Cisco and, and many other funding partners is homelessness prevention. So stopping homelessness before it even starts is really kind of the new frontier and something that we really have to perfect because we're seeing, as Aaron mentioned, the numbers rise and we have to get ahead of that. So homelessness prevention is folks who are housed but they are about to be homeless. And so we come in uh, with flexible funding, support, and get them stabilized so they don't ever have to have that experience. Wonderful. Chad, Chad's group, uh, Destination Home, is really on the cutting edge, not just for Silicon Valley, but for the country, just in terms of basically changing the technology of how we approach homelessness. Just like technology, it's changed in the last 10 or 20 years. So has the, the uh, response to homelessness. So Destination Home has you know, uh, supported organizations like PATH and kind of strongly encouraged us to change our paradigm. So we used to be a transitional housing program where you give a person a bed and that's, that, that'll solve homelessness. Now it's about you don't give a person a bed, you give a person a home and you surround that home with support and services. And it's really changed our paradigm of how how we operate. Everything we do now is about how do we move somebody into a home and not how do we get somebody into a bed and give them three hots and a cot. It's really changed a lot. And, and even now it's changing. So for example, in the state of California, they just released the homeless numbers. And throughout the state, the numbers have gone up 23%. And yet there's so much millions of dollars that have been invested in into housing first, which is what we're doing now. But the numbers are going up. So there's a whole nother area that we have to address is what Chad talked about is the whole idea of prevention, that homelessness is a extreme poverty issue. And this country really has to address the issues that are causing poverty that so that because people are ending up homeless. So it's not just we can't build our way out of homelessness with homes anymore. We have to stop the flow, and that's basically dealing with the poverty issues in our country. Mm. And I know in Santa Clara County, I, I know that you all have housed over 6,000 people in the last few years, and yet for every one person they're housing, I think about two and a half people become yeah. homeless, yeah. right? So yeah. if you can't affect, you know, if you can't actually address the underlying causes behind it, uh, you're only going to make so much progress. Yeah. And I yes. think that with, with Housing First, um, I, I think it's just been this shift where, you know, emergency shelters or different services for people that were homeless, it's treating a symptom. It's not solving the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think the solutions are very depending on people's circumstances, but providing a home is solving the problem as well. Right. Yeah, so, you know, Chad, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on how homelessness can be solved. I'd love to throw it over to Joel. What do you have? Can you expand more on the solutions that you have as well? It, 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 it's just a whole different way of we look at things, not just for us as agencies that are helping people who are homeless, but even for volunteers and, and for people who want to try to do something. You know, in the old days, it was on Thanksgiving, cook a meal and help a per, you know, feed a person who's homeless. Today, it's about how do we actually move people into homes? I mean, we, we move in about 2,000 people 
a year into apartments. And when we first started doing that, my, I was losing sleep over the fact that maybe we're moving people into empty apartments. <laughs> and so how do we provide the furniture and the goods for that? And that's where we said, let's turn to our 20,000 volunteer base and say, no more cooking meals. Let's, let's set up apartments just as if it was your college kid going to the, into the dorm. Let's set up an apartment so that the house becomes a home. And it's really changed the paradigm of how we all work as a community to address homelessness. That's awesome. I know that Cisco volunteers have done the exact same thing. They've set up tons of homes and I've seen it and it's, it's wonderful. Um, so Aaron, yeah. what are more things that Cisco and Destination Home are doing together um, in the Bay Area? Yeah, so Cisco and Destination Home, we, we launched our partnership last March. Uh, Cisco's made a $50 million commitment to Destination Home, really to jointly uh, address homelessness in Santa Clara County. And it's really building off of the tremendous work that Destination Home has been leading for the last 10 years as a public-private partnership that's working really closely with the city of San Jose and Santa Clara County. They were really instrumental in passing Measure A, which was uh, a bond measure passed in November 2016 that made nearly a billion dollars available in general obligation bonds to produce more housing for the homeless and for the extremely low income. We know that that's the solution. The problem has been there's just a scarcity of housing across the board in, in the Bay Area, in Santa Clara County, and especially so at the lowest end. That's, um, I think, last year. Uh, San Jose in, in 2018, they met 14% uh, of their housing production targets for the extremely low income. Mm -hmm. They uh, hit 94% at the market rate um, for housing production. So it's just the segment that is, is the most vulnerable, most in need, and most left behind. And so um, a, the largest proportion of our 50 million is going towards leveraging Measure A funding so that we can inject private flexible capital to help secure land faster, to help provide loans uh, or grants to affordable housing developers to prioritize extremely low income housing or permanent supportive housing or to tie up land faster while the government is doing their due diligence and environmental scans and then passing over to the government. So one example was a um, million dollars that Destination Home used to tie up um, a piece of land that the developer then got $29 million in Measure A funding to be able to develop. So that's a large part of what we're doing. We're also focusing on homelessness prevention and supporting the early stage pilots and expansion uh, of the homelessness prevention program in Santa Clara County with over 10 emergency uh, agency networks. And then uh, also looking at technology. We're a mm -hmm. tech company. It's um, our core competency. We know it won't solve the problem, but we know there's a lot of opportunities to streamline processes, improve data sharing across um, across government entities, across the, the frontline organizations working with the homeless, and then also solutions for the homeless population um, to really be able to access their documents and information. So we're looking at a lot of really exciting um, opportunities around technology as well. Great. Yeah, our partnership with Cisco has been incredible. We're, we're very grateful. Um, from CEO to the facility staff who helps us when we are able to use rooms for different events. Um, everybody has just really embraced us. Um, also, it's really been a game changer for how we can approach solving homelessness in Santa Clara County um, because we have the tools that we need and the support to really be proactive and drive the solutions rather than just respond and fill holes here and there. Um, so that's helping us get into the policy world at a local level, at a state level. Um, it's helping us, as Erin mentioned, um, you know, provide capacity to organizations like PATH, who also has a development arm. Um, to acquire land, to get involved in development deals um, that otherwise wouldn't pencil out. You know, there would be no incentive for the developer to, to build units at the affordability level that we need for folks coming off the streets. Um, it's allowed us to really expand our homelessness prevention system. Um, we started out serving around 300 households per year, um, and thanks to Cisco's support, um, as well as some other funders, we're now up to 900 families, so a huge expansion there. Um, adding services uh, like domestic violence providers, uh, legal and eviction services, to really um, build a system that has what we need to address the issues. 
And then on the technology front, I am very excited about um, mostly the client-facing, uh, our, our user-facing uh, solution. So we're going to build out, we're exploring building out a user portal. So if you think of kind of like your medical insurance, your Kaiser, your, your United Healthcare, you log in and you, you talk to your doctor and you check your medical history and you make appointments, well, we want to be able to have that uh, accessible to folks who are uh, in our database, who are accessing services at organizations like PATH. Um, and so we, they can really be empowered through their journey off, you know, out of the streets into housing and beyond. Um, Joel, do you want to talk about potentially, uh, for example, the capacity building grants that we've been working on with your firm? So uh, a good example of the Cisco and Destination Home Partnership is uh, a building that we're building uh, with the support of Destination Home and Cisco in downtown San Jose. And it's 84 apartment units. We call it permanent supportive housing, and we literally did street outreach in the downtown area and uh, found the most uh, vulnerable people on the streets, and those are the people that are going to move into this building. And we needed destination home. We needed a council member and the mayor to you know, really convince the neighborhood that we're not going to be a skid row shelter and, and be a magnet and attract more people who are homeless in the neighborhood, but we're actually going to build this really cool, modern building that's going to take 84 people off the streets in their neighborhood and into homes. And, it, and the, it, the stars aligned and it all worked out. The neighborhood said, OK, the funding was there and the political support was there. Well, just to add on to that, it has been really exciting to see this partnership kind of organically grow. And I think that's due in large part to our CEO, Chuck Robbins, who, you know, this is a cause that he cares very deeply about. Uh, and it has talked about and promotes. And I think it's something that's really captured you know, the excitement um, and passion of, of our employee base that want to get involved and do more. So there have been you know, move-in kit building you know, events um, for the very first permanent supportive housing uh, complex that opened a couple weeks ago. There were Cisco volunteers that um, volunteered in half-day shifts throughout the week of move-ins, moving people that were chronically homeless into apartments. Um, and it's just been incredible to see people come around this cause. And we've, we've ended up doing more in the areas of supporting Destination Homes advocacy efforts. Our Office of Inclusion and Collaboration is getting very involved in supporting the race and equity research and um, initiatives there. So it's it's been really, I think, exciting to see this continue to just build momentum and grow. It's I. That's what I was going to talk about. I really love watching the employees at Cisco who kind of got thrown into this partnership. Um, <laughs> really kind of embrace the issue and dig in and understand, you know, what is housing first? What does permanent supportive housing mean? And all of these elements. And then we have uh, very frequent conversations where it's collaborative and we, we want the input of everybody at the table, including Cisco. And it's not just a, a traditional like, well, here's funding, now go do what you do and report back to us about how it's going. Uh, it's been pretty incredible. That's great. I'm seeing some questions on Facebook for folks who want to get involved. So how can people volunteer? How can they help in their communities? So for, for Cisco employees, we've um, ended up uh, our community relations team, which leads employee engagement and volunteer uh, activities, are constantly putting together different events and posting them on Bright Funds. So there's also a newsletter for Bay Area employees uh, around kit building events and, and different opportunities locally. Uh, I can at least say for those that are attending Cisco Live next week, there will be plenty of opportunities. Cisco Live is partnering with give to get to um, to organize a number of volunteer events that will be taking place Monday through Thursday at the Social Impact Zone, which will be outside of the San Diego Convention Center. And there will be um, meal kits, um, family food kits, school kits, um, blankets, clothes, furniture building, a, a ton of activities for uh, the homeless community and, and those that are um, facing food insecurity in the San Diego area. And for those that can't make it to the social impact zone, there will be pop-ups throughout uh, the convention center and the Marriott uh, where attendees can, can participate in giving back and volunteer activities there. Something that we find, we've, we get a lot of similar inquiries in response to our Facebook posts, et cetera, like how can I get involved? And we find that 
the majority of folks are supportive of housing um, and, and ending homelessness, and they don't always know necessarily how to go about that or how to talk about it. And really, to confront the, the other side that doesn't want housing, doesn't want affordable housing in their neighborhood. So we've created a whole campaign and a set of tools uh, we call it housing ready communities um, that people can use and you can use this it's very uh, there are some elements of it that are focused in Santa Clara County about specific de developments that are in the pipeline and specific council meetings or community meetings that people can show up to um, but a lot of the skills are transferable to really any community and could be picked up um, and if folks want to visit housingready.org um, it's a very simple uh, kind of gateway into all of those tools and we really invite people to learn more about homelessness, understand what the population really looks like, and understand more about the solutions so they can go back and talk to their friends, talk to their faith-based communities, and talk to their politicians about uh, the solution, which is building more housing. Joel, how about yourself? I, I would, I, thanks, Chad. I, I, I would say if someone came to me and said, how can I get involved? It doesn't matter what community you're in. If you go to a group that's helping people are homeless, just ask them, how can I help people move into their home? Not how can I feed them, how can I shelter them, but how can I help them move, move into their home? Because then if, if the agency is really helping people move into homes, they'll have opportunities for it. If it's just temporary band-aids, as you shared before, um, it, that's just a temporary solution. Um, the, the other thing is, Given the fact that we're seeing that homelessness is a significant societal issue, we, we have to ha get involved politically. And homelessness is not, a, is not a left issue or a right issue. It's an American issue, and it's affecting our whole country. And we have to kind of get involved in changing the system and, and changing the priorities of this country. And I'm not a politician, and I don't plan to be one. But I do know that I've been doing this for 23 years and we've been, you know, year after year housing people, but we're seeing that there's a system problem and that if, if we keep doing this and not change the system, we're going to be doing this for another 100 years. So we really have to change the system as well. And that's where we need people's help. I think on that, I mean, we've we've seen the NIMBY movement, the Not In My Backyard, and it, I think it's, it's generally a minority, but it's a very vocal minority um, that can really block progress here and so I think you know getting more politically involved becoming a community advocate and saying yes in my backyard I think yes. is something anybody can do I've been really inspired lately because I've learned a lot about the policies that kind of got us to this place and recognizing that they were policies that were enacted in a place and time and we can do the same now to, to change the course, right? Um, locally in San Jose, for example, we collectively got involved in a policy that makes sure that every development going forward has 45% of the unit set aside for the lowest level of income. Uh, so for, the, for folks coming off of the streets or people who are on fixed senior income or disabled income. Um, so now, going forward, every development has that requirement, and that could really change the number of units in a dramatic way. So, you know, as Joel and Aaron mentioned, you know, the time is now to, to change the policies, yeah. have new policies that change the yeah. course. That's great. A, a, few, a few years ago, uh, my deputy CEO and I talked about how we could get more involved in changing the system. She was 28 years old three years ago. She said, then I'm going to run for Congress. And she did. And last year she won. She's the second youngest congresswoman or congress member in D.C. It's Katie Hill. And now she's, you know, we're talking about how do we change the system, you know, on the federal level. And that's what we need because we just need everybody from the federal level to the local level saying enough is enough. We've got to stop this. Cisco also has a pledge online that folks can take. It's at cs.co slash take dash the dash pledge. And it's basically a commitment for folks who want to make a positive impact um, on people, society, and the planet. So check it out. There's already been 1,696 pledges made. So go check that out. And next, we do have a bunch of questions coming in from Facebook and all of these comments. Um, from Sarah on Facebook, and this is to all of you guys. What are the main factors contributing to the rise of homelessness in the Bay Area over the last few years? 
I mean, the number one answer is that rents are going up and incomes are staying flat. Um, yeah. In the service industry jobs, in the kind of middle, what we call middle wage job, apprenticeship type jobs, um, the wages have just very slightly increased, but rents, you know, have gone up 30, 40 percent. So that's the bottom line. Out of that, if you're somebody in that situation and you have a safety net, you have a family you can come in and go stay at their place, you probably don't end up homeless. But if you're already coming from a place of poverty or uh, foster youth, you know, don't have like a permanent family, um, one little thing like that can really set you on a course toward homelessness. I think a lot of it too is the population's grown and housing production just hasn't kept pace. And so there's not enough housing for a growing population which drives up rent, drives up the costs, um, and and the wages have not increased at the same pace. Um, the, the minimum wage in California is, is higher than the national wage, um, but even you know at 11 25 an hour you'd need five minimum wage jobs to afford an apartment in the in the Bay Area, it's just not a, it's not affordable. So a lot of it is just not enough housing, not enough living wages, um, and increased costs of living. And Aaron, you mentioned earlier, it's not just happening in the Bay Area. It's in most of the major cities on the West Coast where where property values are going up and rents are going up. It, it's it's a big issue. Here's a question from Chandra on Facebook. How do you know the housing first approach works? What are some of the results from that approach? That's a great question. <laughs> um, so locally, uh, we're at 92% success rate, uh, spanning back over six years of doing housing first as a, as a philosophy for folks staying in their homes for 12 months or more. So this is a pretty high bar standard for tracking long-term retention in housing. Um, those numbers are look similar nationwide. Um, so the, what we've learned statistically and anecdotally is that if you put someone in their home, even if they're um, drinking a lot of alcohol, using a lot of drugs, have mental health issues, once you have the safety of the home, um, people, like we all do, take care of it and they want to be safe and they want to have a home and they want to live a good life. So the rest kind of follows from there. It doesn't mean the work is done. I used to say that 20% of the work was finding housing and getting somebody into the place. And then the other 80% other is connecting them to the right support services and helping people find a community. Because um, that's what, what I have that keeps me grounded. And a lot of times when you're out on the street for a long time, you kind of disengage from society and you don't really have a community. You don't have a support network, friends, family, et cetera. And I mean, part of the idea of housing first too is, yeah, how, how difficult would it be to get a job if you're living on the streets, if you don't have a home? Where do you shower? Where do you get ready? What, I mean, it's just, how do you get sober? How do you get, you know, consistent mental health treatment? And the whole idea is just housing is that, you know, stabilizing foundation upon which you can get additional services and get back up on your feet. Years ago, we measured success by how many people we fed and how many people came in to our beds. Today, we measure success on how many people actually move into homes. And every week, we move 30 people into a home around the state. And to me, I see it. I see it every day, you know, uh, that the fact that moving people into homes is the success in keeping them there and supporting them. And, you know, there have also been studies, one led by Destination Home, that looked at the cost of just treating homelessness, right, with the emergency shelters, emergency psychiatric care, ER visits, all of the different strains on our public systems by keeping people on the streets. It costs more. Um, I think Santa Clara County spent, what was it, $560 million Yeah, every on, single year. Every single year on treating homelessness rather than solving for it. So we also know it's actually more cost effective to house people and provide subsidies for housing than to keep them on the streets. That's a, another reason why the support that Cisco provided and we're kind of lever trying to leverage into other private support um, goes with the Measure A bond that Aaron mentioned earlier is because we know from that cost study that there is, you know, a quote unquote price tag on solving homelessness in Santa Clara County. It's just about generating enough uh, revenue, enough money to be able to do that and build more housing and provide the supportive services. 
uh, that'll be necessary for people to stay successful in that housing first model. Yeah. So this is a question from Brad on YouTube. How can we more effectively address the role of mental illness in causing people to become unhoused? <laughs> Chad, you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would be on that one, Joel. Um, you know, this is a mental health and and challenges with mental health that folks have on the street is a is a major factor in homelessness, um, and it's not always the ones that we see. Um, a lot of times, it's you know folks who are are struggling with a learning disability or depression or anxiety, et cetera. And because of those underlying circumstances, as life has happened, it's caused uh, things to get off track. Um, I think that when I talk to the folks, we have a board of individuals who are all currently or formerly homeless. We call it the Lived Experience Advisory Board. And amplifying and having more services for folks with mental health conditions on the street is actually one of their number one concerns, number one goals, because they see it, they live it, they've been in encampments and they know how mental health is affecting people. So I think generally our society just has to get more comfortable with the fact that a lot of us have mental health issues and it's not a disease or you know a scarlet letter, it's something that we can embrace and work through. Um, and then I think we have to be very realistic about the types of supports that people will need in order to be successful in their housing, in their case management, which is like the, the supportive services that people get when they're in housing, um, and the way that we provide services uh, you know, from the government, social services, and the kind of safety net services, et cetera. I think part of it, too, and, and again, is Poverty exacerbates this, right? I mean, how many people do we know that suffer from mental illness, anxiety, depression, whatever, um, but have access to insurance or you know the proper treatment to stay to stay housed? If you're already poor, you can't you can't afford things. I feel like things tend to snowball, right? And it's the same with drug addiction, even. You know, I think it's now a quarter of Americans have are addicted to opioids. Not all of them are homeless, and so I, I do think there's a strong correlation between people that are already poor, don't have access to the right resources and help, that then become homeless, and then it it just gets worse from there. I was just going to say the same thing. Just remember, even people who are housed struggle with mental health issues. So we're, we're really seeing this in our, we're learning more about this from the data and the information and working with people in our homelessness prevention system. Because there again, we're looking at people who are in poverty, but they're not homeless yet. And so we're, we're having a new look and, and much more information on what do folks look like? What do families look like? Um, what are the circumstances? What's going on? for people who are on the brink of homelessness and how can we start to address those issues and we are finding that um, histories of homelessness is a big factor um, very recent experience of violence in the home is a huge contributor um, chronic health conditions uh, we're having with 10 percent of the population is senior and another 10 percent is is youth under 24. Uh, so some of, see there's some of the factors that if you're already in poverty kind of pushes people over the edge with youth, what is it? It's it's like over 50% of youth that age out of the foster care system become homeless within six months. Staggering. Right? So, I mean, we, we know <laughs> some of the gaps in, in the social systems and societal problems that really do need addressing to, to be able to prevent a lot of this from happening. Yeah. So, Erin and Chad, you've discussed um, some of the things that Cisco and Destination Home are already doing, but we have some more questions. This is from Amanda on YouTube. Can you share some examples of improvements made to decrease homelessness since Cisco has partnered with Destination Home, specifically around our technology? So the technology is a really interesting bucket because it's something that um, in our world is very people-based. And we're, we've been really focused on the solutions, you know, how to house people, how to work with people and, and get them the right support. Um, and so our partnership with Cisco has, has allowed us to take a look at our technology. Um, we are lucky that at Destination Home and as a community, we are very focused on data. Um, and that's a really a core pillar of how we approach solving problems. Um, but we're learning that, for example, 
we need to actually take a step back and look at the facilities where services are provided and make sure that they have things like ubiquitous Wi-Fi or the ability for clients who go in there for services to charge their cell phones because everyone has a smartphone. However, most of them are dead half the time from a battery standpoint. And so, you know, in order to keep touch with family, in order to keep touch with your caseworker or get that call for a job or get the call for an apartment, you need to be able to have Wi-Fi you know, charging, a place to, to rest and kind of check in on the computer. You know, we're all on the computer all day, every day through, through our laptops and our cell phones. Um, and at home now, my TV has the internet on it. Um, and so, you know, everyone needs that now to, to stay involved in society. So through the technology, we're looking at kind of the hardware infrastructure and the support that our facilities have in our system so that we can make sure we can do some of the more advanced work around you know, predictive analytics or data warehousing and things like that. And I will say that's probably the area that's, that's in the earliest stage. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we didn't want to come in and be really prescriptive and say, you, and, and presume that we knew the answers because we're a tech company or you know, that, that this would be a silver bullet. Uh, and so the first thing that Destination Home did was commission a study to really look at the state of, of things, the organizations and the technology they use, um, homeless individuals mm -hmm. and their access to, to technology and information, the, the county, the city, um, and where where there were gaps and where there's different opportunities, both short term and long term. And we're now in the process of prioritizing. But I wouldn't say it's the technology that's going to reduce homelessness. I think it will increase efficiencies for the organizations that allow them to allocate resources more towards the services. It may improve the services and their ability to respond to the needs of, of the clients that they're, that they're working with. Um, but that alone is not, I don't think, what's, what's really going to, to reduce. It's, it's going to streamline processes and hopefully um, reduce the time people are on the streets um, by improving the, the speed and efficiency of the, the organizations working with them. Wonderful. Well, I have one last question, and this one is a personal one that I just thought of, <laughs> um, because listening to you guys, clearly you guys are the experts, you have done the research, you know what you're talking about. I'd love for you to address the audience with one final message on, you know, what, what they should know about homelessness. Is there one thing that you think the general public should know about homelessness that you've, that you've seen? <laughs> I mean, for me, you know, homeless people are people just like all of us. And, you know, as Aaron mentioned, you know, it's, it's really just about where you are economically and what kind of support you have around you is the only difference between whether I become homeless or the person that we pass on the street every day is homeless. So keeping that in mind, we don't want to lose the energy and the kind of the spirit that we have in this community and this country to solve the issue because it's very easy to get jaded and say, man, like we've been doing all of this work and the numbers are going up and I just see it everywhere and I have to keep living my life and move on. But, but that's a very dangerous place because the problem won't solve itself. Um, and so I, I just, you know, remind everybody that homelessness is all of us um, and that the solution is very easy. It's housing and let's build more of it. Yeah, yeah. We we have uh, 700 staff around the state, and the one thing I always tell them is you just have to keep your eye on the ball. And the ball is moving that person through the front door into their home. There's so much noise around us. There's neighborhoods that don't want us. There's people who are homeless that struggle and sometimes fail several times, and, it, and it's difficult for our case managers there's the political stuff going on around us and there's lack of funding or resources and, and, and we just have to keep our eye on the ball. And I would say that to all our volunteers and supporters as well, that it's just about moving one person through the front door into their home. That's what this is all about. I can't say mine's super original. It's, it's uh, building off of what Chad said, but I think a big part of the problem with homelessness is people can't relate to it. And I think that's a natural, I think, reaction to kind of see them as other or see their condition as a result of something that they did. Um, and maybe makes us feel better like it could never happen to us. But I think I would encourage everybody to 
see the person, see see the human there, um, and and really um, kind of put yourself in their situation, and, and become a part of the the solution. Great. Yes. Thank you for answering all of our questions. And my last question to Aaron, Joel, and Chad for their time today, for your candidness, and for a very informative discussion. Um, for anyone who wants to learn more about um, homelessness, go to blogs.cisco.com slash CSR to find blogs on this topic. Also, if you want to take the pledge, go to cs.co slash take dash the dash pledge. Um, thanks for watching Cisco Chat Live, and we'll see you next time.